This is NDTV. And you're watching Classics. Hello and welcome to India's Tryst with Destiny, another in our series on this country's 60th year since independence. Today we shall focus on 60 years of the media, newspapers and the younger of the two, television and the new media. But most agree that if there's one thing that clearly differentiates India from other developing nations, it's our free media. In fact, many argue that India's media is probably freer and more courageous than in many advanced countries. We don't have embedded journalists here, for example. Our media is something we are hugely proud of, but it has its failings and its challenges ahead. To discuss the state of India's media today and over the last 60 years and to look ahead at what changes we can expect in the future, the good, the bad and the ugly, we have a panel of leaders in this field. Uh, N. Ram, editor of Hin The Hindu, clearly the most respected newspaper in India. Madhu Treyan, who started India Today, the magazine that changed quality of journals in India. Madhu also started Newstrack, the weekly video journal, daring in times when media was controlled by the government. We all waited each week for the next edition of Newstrack. Vinod Mehta, the editor who revolutionized newspaper journalism and presentation and who's now editor of Outlook. And most of all, we have Amita Malik, both a practitioner of journalism and a columnist and India's best known critic. I must say, we're all terrified of you, actually. Uh, many would argue that, in fact, it's a little incestuous to ask media leaders to speak on the media. But I think you'll find that years of experience have converted their DNA into being objective. For it, uh, That's the essence of their trade. Well, let's start this whole discussion with our first basic issue that we're looking at today. Our first topic is, is India's media working with freedom without responsibility? Is there no punishment for defamation or libel? Is this a problem that we face? Ram, is this a problem that uh, the defamation laws exist, but it takes 25 years for it to be implemented? So you, basically, journalists can write anything these days. And there's no check and balance on journalism today. Is that a problem? Yes, uh, as you know, Pranoy, we are in a very strange situation where the civil process, uh, the law of civil uh, defamation takes a long time to, to come into uh, to effect. But the other thing is deadly, criminal defamation, because there the process is the punishment, as one of the lawyers right. said a long time ago. Yes. Uh, and they, they can harass you no end, and uh, uh, we, we both faced it, uh, anyone in this uh, trade. So I think... Uh, uh, the problem, we must decriminalize the law of defamation, but then the quid pro quo should be do something about fast tracking the, uh, those the who have a genuine grievance uh, uh, from journalists. Uh, in other words, deliver justice quickly on the civil, uh, civil defamation front. How do you do it? Ask the judiciary. Right. Yeah. But do you think that the journalists should take a lead in this to make sure that there is some check and balance? that there should be huge fines on papers and, and television when they, they defame somebody in, uh, or there's libel? You know, it's quite clear to me that freedom and responsibility go hand in hand. So obviously we won't argue that there should be freedom and there should be no responsibility. That is the sort of so-called prerogative of the, of, of, of the prostitute. So, but I, I worry slightly about this subject because I don't think it's a very major concern. I think there are two areas, problem areas here. One is who's going to impose this responsibility. Right. We as a profession have to be very careful that that imposition or that responsibility either comes from within our own organizations or within the profession, self-regulation. Self-regulation. The last thing we want to do, and I think that we have seen this in the broadcast bill, we don't want the government anywhere near us. Right. Because they mean trouble. They, when they say they want to make us responsible, they actually want to censor us. Right. So one of the things that we have to ensure, and that's in our interest, that we create organs of self-regulation and don't give these chaps a well, leg in. are we in. doing that, Madhu? Are we 
taking the lead and, co and creating, being, as regulating ourselves and ensuring that there's no defamation? Or are we just waiting for the government to step in? I think it's v one of the biggest and most difficult jobs of the editors today to be able to understand and control their reporters. Uh, I think the reporters are a, are a reflection of what is happening in our society today, which is you have honest doctors and then you have doctors who will do surgery when it's not required. There are lawyers who take their clients for a ride. In the same way, there are journalists who are either co-opted by parties or by business houses. And very often, the editor will only get to know after the fact, when the complaints come in. So that is a huge factor. And the editor is the only one who can create that culture. But, how but however... how expect an editor or a journalist to regulate themselves and ensure that they are fined themselves heavily if they do some if they defame someone well, will we ever do that I, I think that you know I, we've had many personal experiences where reporters have put quotes in without asking anyone um, and then later on you speak to the editor and the editor says why are you taking it so seriously it's only about the drinking age now if a, for example my husband they misquoted him didn't speak to him and wrote that he uh, says that the drinking age should be lowered when he spoke to the editor and said no reporter spoke to me, she says it's such a light subject. Now, as a doctor, it's not a light subject. Of course not. So it was but taken. He had no recourse. He, I mean, he if had he no sued recourse. the newspaper, and this has happened has repeatedly with uh, people we know and with us. There is no recourse because there is a high-handedness that comes in. That there, of course, there are editors who take instant uh, action, and there is an apology. But as you know, the apology is a little in a little box and not right. in the same size or no, whatever. Uh, well, I mean, this business about yes, we don't want the government to impose or get in. Uh, start regulating the media because then they have different uh, objectives altogether. But is it too much to ask the average journalist or editor to regulate himself? Is he going to find himself ever? Uh, surely not. Uh, he ought to be able to do it. And coming to your own field, which is that of television, I think much more control can be exercised by the medium on young reporters. Some of them do go overboard. You cannot escape. Ram and I are editors. The can stops with him and the can stops yes. with me. We can't keep blaming other people. If our reporters, if we have a star reporter, if there's a reporter out of hand, it's the job of the editor to crack the whip and get him back. Otherwise, what are you and I in, in uh, sitting in our chairs for? And we don't do that. We have star reporters these days who are untamed. But secondly, the most important thing here that we must remember is that we don't get into self-regulation unless we see the genie near the door. Right. When the government, when the government comes, comes in, then we, otherwise we all sit That's back and we talk about self-regulation. in the UK, where they threatened to censor the press because of the excesses. <clears throat> because now exactly recently exactly. in the UK, they've had some major fines for defamation in libel. Yeah. And of course no, in America. The reality is that we're looking at <coughs> our leading daily is a paper that people know where you can buy editorial. What does that say about us? Oh, right. People are read buying it. I don't know if they're reading it. It's the leading newspaper. If you can buy editorial, what does that say to about our profession? No. It is done unashamedly. It worry you and it's that. never discussed on television or whatever. It's a, a subject that, we, yes, you yes. can do it. We know that when we're reading... Everybody frowns on it, but nothing is done. And, but it, does it worry you, Ram, that because the media in India is not doing anything to stop it, a, the institution will degenerate and B, the government will come in. Yes. And they'll um, feel justified. There's no immediate danger, I think, of the government uh, government coming in because it dare, it dare not. Right. It's, it's been burnt when it tried with the defamation mm -hmm. bill in 88. Yes. But, but the other part of the question is vital, the answer to that. We must do something about it. One way is to do within the organization, but I also believe that the industry or the profession uh, can work out in a voluntary way a code of practice that can be, for example, on suicides. Uh, this is one of the things The Guardian has added to this book. Uh, they had a picture of a woman throwing herself down, and it's well known it had a terrible impact. Uh, the, the, one of the papers published it, the other didn't. Or gruesome pictures, how do you use that? Things like that. Right. See, Pranav, the problem is, I think, at the end of the day, as long as I remember, I've discussed this subject at least for 20 years. And you discuss it and you go back home. I suggest that six or eight of exactly. the leading print and electronic editors home. get together 
we next we week. We agree right away. I agree right away. Three Get together, us. eight of us, six or eight of us, newspapers, television, and do the first draft of the code. It's, I tell you, it doesn't require, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. I think we could, if eight people sat together in two hours' time, we could draft the code. But nobody does it, well, we'll do un it. until somebody comes knocking at our door and says we are going Actually, in. Actually, Arun Shuri has published a very good code of conduct for yeah, journalists. Yeah, well, should look at that. In does it have a fiscal <clears throat> penalties, financial penalties, if you go no, wrong? Because no. eventually, that's what will hurt. If we all have to just write a you know apology or a box or eventually you need somebody to actually fine you, will that ever happen? You've been you've been writing know, about this for years that uh, the media goes wild at times and there's yes, nothing and I've done to it. Been writing about having a code of conduct and having an organisation in the media itself, right. which controls its own actions. It's crucial. But um, I think we have all perhaps neglected something. It's all very well to talk of Mr. Ram and Vinod Mehta. But what is the position of the editor now in some papers? I mean, if the proprietors uh, keep on uh, letting certain things get by, especially this buying of editorials and things like that, then where do those papers stand? We should get a combination of fines and also the moral ignominy. I think, Pranay, don't yes. underestimate that for an editor. Uh, uh, for someone to say in the front page that this editor has been censored, I, it, I would permanently hide my head in shame. I think that is very important and so the fines may be important, but I think to censure him and to publicly uh, expose him and, and finger him, I think that itself will also be a deterrent. Okay, we'll take a short break at that point. I think we're all agreed that it's time Indian Newspapers and television editors got together and regulated themselves before the government steps in and regulates them. Uh, we'll take a break at that point. When we come back, we'll t look at another issue. Are we moving from an era of the first 40 years of India where you had, had government control, at least on television, to an era, era where the market is controlling everybody? From the tyranny of the government to the tyranny of market. That's in a few moments from now.